people. See, with a remarkable coalition of people, deeply concerned about the park. Clearly, they have recaptured that vision of 1892. Our state has been given an that park has been handed over to us to use, but not to abuse. The proposal that we're introducing today will take advantage of the park's resources and at the same time enable us to pass along that legacy to future generations. I'd like to introduce, and incidentally, I am one of the prime sponsors of the bill. I ask to do that because of the importance of this legislation, but the two gentlemen, as I mentioned before, who really put this thing together were Maurice Hinchy and Pete Gratis. I'd like to call out Maurice for a few words. First of all, I'd like to express my appreciation for the encouragement and the support that uh, Speaker Weber has given to us uh, throughout the term of his speakership while we've been working on this on this project. Uh, I've met with virtually every group in the Adirondacks and it required a number of trips up there in order to accomplish that purpose. Secondly, I want to thank especially uh, Assemblyman Grants uh, for his uh, devotion to the conservation ethic and his awareness of the special place that the Adirondacks plays in our state and the good work that he has done in helping us to develop this bill. Also to my staff, Diana Swain, who has devoted an enormous amount of time to uh, putting this, this, this uh, bill together. She's my counsel and uh, worked very diligently on this. I know people, people from Pete's staff do as well. This uh, year, 1992, marks the centennial of uh, the creation of the Adirondack Park. The Adirondack Park, of course, encompasses more than 6 million acres. 2.4 million, which so or 43%, are publicly owned. The park is the largest state park in the contiguous <coughs> United States. It contains over 40 peaks that are 4,000 feet high or higher. The geographical, geological rather, formations uh, in the park are some 1.2 billion years old. They are the oldest geological formations on the continent. The park is also home to people. There are 130,000 residents who live there year round. That number doubles with, with summertime residents, and the park plays host during the course of every year to approximately 9 million visitors. Those 9 million visitors enjoy the 45 state campgrounds, the 3,000 miles of trails for hiking, snowmobiling, skiing, and horseback riding, 1,300 miles of wild, scenic, and recreational rivers, most open to fishing, boating, and whitewater canoeing and rafting, 1 million acres of wetlands in the park, 80 acres of alpine tundra, 2,800 lakes and ponds, 30,000 miles of, of brooks and streams. It is the watershed for Lake Champlain, the Hudson, Black, St. Lawrence, and the Mohawk rivers. It is, in fact, one of the most extraordinary and important specific geological and geographical areas of the entire country. We have worked hard to try to develop a bill which will address the needs of the Adirondacks that serves all the people of this state, and also a bill which will address the needs of the people who live in the park, who make it their, their home year round. And I think we've succeeded in crafting a bill which is sensitive to the need to balance both of those objectives. First of all, the bill addresses itself, and let me say this, that this is the first comprehensive reorganization of the state law dealing with the Adirondack Park in 20 years since the park was established in 1972. What does the bill do? The bill, first of all, seeks to protect shorelines and backcountry, and the protection for those two parts of the of the, uh, the park which are in desperate need of additional protection, shorelines around lakes and uh, the backcountry, the protection there is increased. We establish something called homestead protection. Residents of the park will be allowed under this, under this bill to subsidize, subdivide, subdivide their property and make gifts to immediate members of their family, to their children, members who may build one residence without regard to density guidelines. One of the things that we heard most in our, in our tour of the park was from people who said that the density guidelines on my property do not even allow me to pass off a piece of my land to my, to my children, to my son, to my daughter, so that they can build a home and raise their family here in, the, in this uh, part of New York State that we love so much. This bill recognizes that need and says to those people, regardless of the density guidelines, 
you will be permitted to subdivide your property so that you can pass on the opportunity to, to build a home to your children. The bill contains substantial provisions that deal with economic development. First of all, it instructs the Department of Economic Development to develop a comprehensive tourism plan, tourism being one of the most important, perhaps the most important, industry in the Adirondacks. It further uh, directs the Department of Economic Development to reopen its Adirondack office, which was closed last year, and also to identify sites within the park where new development is appropriate. In other words, the Department of Economic Development will now be required to take a proactive role in working with communities to, to uh, delineate and define for them those areas of the park that, that can and ought to be developed in appropriate ways. The Community Development Corporation, which is established in this bill, must provide technical assistance for infrastructure development and for funding part of that infrastructure development. Also, the Department of Transportation must conduct a feasibility study on reinstating rail service between Remsen and Lake Placid. There are provisions in the bill that deal with local planning. The Local Government Regional Planning and Review Board is empowered to provide technical and financial planning assistance to local governments, and funding for that purpose is, is provided. The bill makes changes to the Adirondack Park Agency. Responsibility for certain DEC permits, things like signs, stream disturbance, and mining permits, is transferred to the APA consistent with APA land use planning uh, expertise and experience. Also, the APA is empowered to charge fees for processing these permits, and the APA must do an annual report. The bill also makes changes to the Department of Environmental Conservation with regard to its relationship to the park. Region 5 and 6 of the DEC are united to form the Adirondack Park Service. This Adirondack Park Service, APS, is to encourage uniform regulation and management of the park. We believe and we were told by people in the park that it makes much greater sense to have one DEC region in the entire park rather than have the park divided between two DEC regions. The result of its division that way is uh, frequently different interpretations of the state environmental conservation law and different implementation of, of those laws from one region to the other. With one region, regulation and application of DEC law will be uniform throughout the park. The Adirondack Park Service will also take over the two visitor and interpretive centers which have been constructed within the last couple of years within the park. And the APS, and the, APS the Adirondack Park Service, must complete the long overdue unit management plan by April 1 of 1996. There is a provision in the bill that deals with education. It says that the State Education Department will study the feasibility of a Board of Cooperative Educational Services program which will service the entire park so that those kinds of educational services can be made available to all of the residents of the, of the park. An Adirondack Park Trust Fund is established. The trust fund would generate $2 million a year from user fees, such things as boats, docks, airplane hangars, things of that nature, and another $1 million for APA permit fees. So we have $2 million generated annually by user fees, boat docks, airplane hangars, things of that nature. That generates $2 million a year. And then another million dollars would come out of, out of the APA permit fees. Now that's, uh, of that $3 million, $2.5 million would go into the Adirondack Trust Fund. And that would be available for the various purposes that I've outlined on an annual basis, year after year, exclusively within the park. The other half million dollars would go to provide the kind of uh, consistent planning money and, uh, and uh, other activity uh, funding for other activities of the Adirondack Park Agency. The user fees are modeled after existing fees that uh, are levied in, in Lake George currently in, uh, in a bill that was worked out between my, myself and uh, the, uh, the uh, Lake George community about the two years ago. The agency fees are new, as I mentioned, about uh, they are, uh, as I didn't mention that before, uh, for minor projects, they're about $100 or 1% of the capital costs of all other projects. Uh, there are a number of programs that would be funded 
by this Adirondack Park Trust Fund, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. The Community Development Corporation would be created. This public benefit corporation would provide technical assistance related to infrastructure planning and development, things like road, roads, solid waste, sewage, water supply and treatment facilities, and other facilities of that nature. With the use of professional staff, it would stimulate and coordinate intermunicipal projects and uh, seek and obtain the necessary funding. Secondly, local government regional planning and, re and review board would uh, be reconstituted and would develop and administer local plans at uh, the request of local governments, would also make uh, local planning grants available to these local governments. Local governments want to carry out local planning activities. This money would be used to provide uh, financial support for those, uh, those planning grants. And thirdly, there is a working farms and forest fund. Working farms and forest fund. Local governments will receive tax assistance depending upon how much working landscape property is located within their municipal jurisdictions and depending upon how much funding is available in, in the Adirondack Park Trust Fund. In other words, um, for, these, for these working landscapes, working farms and, uh, and uh, timber companies, law provides for reduction in their real property taxes. They receive reductions in real property taxes. Uh, those reductions in real property taxes come out of the local communities. What we're saying here is that uh, the trust fund would, would be used, at least in part, to reimburse those communities for the costs that uh, they bear in the reduction of real property taxes as a result of the fact that they have these working landscapes and farms and uh, timber production activities being carried on in the park. Uh, now those are, are basically the, the provisions of the, of the bill. As I mentioned, uh, this bill has been uh, the work of a number of people Particularly uh, instrumental in developing this legislation was a, a long-time member, 18-year member of the Environmental Conservation Committee and one who has uh, devoted a great deal of time to the conservation ethic and to the Adirondacks Assemblyman Grants. Before I ask him to come to the microphone, I want to mention the other statewide and Adirondack environmental groups that are with us this morning. The National Audubon Society is here, represented by Dave Miller and Eric Seib. The Sierra Club is here, represented by Shelley Kath and Todd Klingerman. We have the Adirondack Council, represented by Peter Borelli, John Sheehan, and Bernard Maluski. The Environmental Planning Lobby, represented by Lee Wasserman. The Adirondack Mountain Club, represented by Neil Woodward. The Residence Committee to Protect the Adirondack, represented by Peter Bauer. And the Association for the Protection of the Adirondacks, represented by Dave Gibson. It's uh, my pleasure now to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Pete Grimms. Not much left to say, Maurice. I want to also thank the speaker for his support and uh, Maurice Hinchy, as well as my uh, staff director, Bill Harvey, and Elise Gray from the speaker's office. And uh, the person that doesn't get a great deal of recognition, Paul Bray from the Bill Drafting Commission, not only brings an extraordinary expertise to the bill, uh, the technical aspects of drafting a bill such as this, but also uh, brings a very, very broad knowledge of environmental issues and particular concern about the Adirondacks. Rachel Carson talked about the uh, close knit fabric of life in her writing in the Silent Spring. And nowhere in New York is this as apparent as in the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks, and we've got some material here that we handed out, is really the inescapable, presents you with the inescapable interdependence of all creation, which is what Rachel Carson talked about. The park is a complex and glorious mixture of public and private interests. It has served as home and resort for countless millions of New Yorkers, from people, for people from around the country and from around the world for generations. In size, diversity, and ownership, the park is also unique in the United States. We've got some uh, numbers up here. If you look at the map, one-fifth of the land area of New York is in the Adirondack Park. 20% of New York State's land area is in the park. Not only is it bigger than all these states, it's the equivalent of New Hampshire, the size of New Hampshire. It is truly a remarkable piece of uh, real estate within the confines of the border. Three times bigger than Yellowstone National Park, uh, and it stands on its own among the great parks of the world. Within its boundaries are vast, pristine forests and open lands, some owned by the state. Uh, many of the lands are open, owned by private interests, lumber companies, private owners, private uh, individuals. It has productive farmlands, it has towns, villages, and hamlets, clean lakes, clear streams, and businesses, as well as homes, schools, and untouched wilderness tracts. 
contains about 90% of all of the designated wilderness areas east of the Mississippi River. It is the largest wilderness tract, obviously, in the northeastern United States. When you talk about the Adirondack Park, you have to resort to superlatives in virtually every area you describe the park. In fact, it has maintained its position as the grandest state park in the United States. It's glowing testament to the success of earlier generations in meeting the challenges of conserving our natural resources within the park's boundaries. Our legislation sets out what we believe is a fair and responsible plan for the continuation of this extraordinary early effort begun 100 years ago. We believe that our plan will protect and preserve the Adirondack Parks and all its resources, its diversity, and its beauty for future generations. And we'll be glad to try and answer any questions you may have. We'll take any questions that you might have now. Yes, there are additional uh, restrictions on development in the backcountry, and uh, there are additional restrictions with regard to uh, shorelines. For example, with regard to shorelines, there are setbacks of uh, uh, 200, 200 feet, I'm oh, sorry, 200 feet of the shorelines, and uh, a uh, critical environmental area is established, which is an area of 650. And the setback will be in all areas of All shorelines. Um, any construction in the future, one of the only plans that wants to build you know, directly on the lake, they can't. They no building directly on the lake. What about a boathouse? Uh, obviously, a boathouse is, is a little bit different. A boathouse is a separate uh, structure. We're talking about the places where people live and uh, from which they would be more like the ones and so forth. So, a boathouse, of course, is a approach in this bill to uh, funding. We had uh, a special 80% tax assessment, which is, which is out, and we have this new funding source, which is in to replace that. Uh, we have established a uh, transfer tax, which would apply only within the Adirondack Park that is out of this bill, and then no longer it was in the other bill, but not in this one. And uh, there are a few other minor provisions, but those are the basic ones that are the major differences. There were some flashpoint issues, some focal point issues that came out of work that the reason I had done in the past and the early things were recommended. We have taken out the large acre zoning restriction, 2,000 acre zoning restriction. There's no transfer of development rights program that we build into this legislation. We've essentially taken out the land speculation and luxury home speculation tax. Uh, there's no transition zone, which was recommended by the Burley Commission, so that that's uh, no longer in the bill. There is no plan, park expansion, or land acquisition program encompassed in the legislation that we're proposing today. Uh, that was in the Burley Commission recommendations. The, uh, there are no stewardship assessment programs. Uh, to the extent that we build in more incentives for local governments and for local communities to participate in the planning process and to be benefited by the programs that are in this bill, we think we've addressed some of the concerns that were raised by local governments in response to the early commission recommendations of the earlier uh, bills that they'll be both responsible in the current Keep in mind, I'm mean, talking about two separate things here. First of all, the difference between this bill and the previous bill that we introduced, and now Pete has introduced the differences between this bill and the early commission report. So why, why did you decide to introduce this bill today? Well, let, let me try to respond, because I've discussed this with the governor 
obviously Pete and Maurice are working very closely with a lot of the environmental groups that have been uh, interested in this subject and I'll continue to be interested in this subject. And I, I indicated to the governor we were filing this bill when I spoke to him last week and it's not greatly dissimilar from the governor's bill. He indicated his office was looking at it very carefully with the idea of discussing whether we can go ahead and pass it to a law. We're also hopeful that the Senate are looking at this bill, which is a little bit of a new approach, will look at the bill with the possibility of negotiating if some negotiation is necessary, a bill that will pass both houses and be signed by the governor. So uh, at, at this point, uh, we feel this is an improvement of the governor's bill uh, due to the work put in by both of these gentlemen and the groups that are involved. So you're saying you think this could be a compromise? Well, in, in the legislative process, there's always room for compromise, but not at the expense of principle. I uh, lent my name to this bill and became a prime sponsor of this bill because I think it's basically the right thing to do. But that doesn't mean, that this, I think this goes for Maurice and Pete too, that if some slight compromises will result in us getting a law instead of a bill, that we don't want to do that. So there's always room for some compromise, but we don't compromise principle. Does, does this bill change the makeup of the APA board? Is, is that one issue that the Senate is going to be really pushing for to have more park residents on the board? This bill doesn't change the makeup of the APA uh, board. We feel that the board, as presently constituted, is uh, representative of uh, the people in the Adirondack Park. And uh, although we thought about that, uh, obviously, uh, we, we didn't see any need to make that change. What, also, by consolidating the workings of uh, DEC, I think we've addressed some of the concerns that have been expressed in the past about the park agency. There will no longer be a split between regions, uh, not only within DEC, but there's a mandate on all state agencies to coordinate their planning and permitting functions to view the park as an entity, not uh, pieces of other districts that answer to different drummers, but to view the park as a unique area and to function accordingly within all state agencies, uh, not only DEC, to allow a uh, a plan and a vision for the park that is totally within the blue line. Uh, the area issue of expansion of the, of the APA was one of those concerns that have come up um, that clearly is uh, something that's, uh, that's been on some people's minds that we need to address it. Do you want to say this for Ron Stafford to get down to basics? I mean, I heard, I heard education was on a high topic. Who was in this to make the Senate change its mind? Well, there's a, there's a lot in here. There's a lot in here. There's a lot in here having to do with economic development. There is uh, a provision to bring two and a half million dollars of new money into the park for local planning and for local infrastructure development each year, year after year. And this is not just a one-shot thing. This is, a, this is a reliable source of income that will come into the park and provide it with the necessary uh, money it needs to help develop a water supply and, and uh, distribution systems, and sewage treatment facilities, roads, bridges, things of that nature. This is, this is uh, I think, unique of all the places in the state where we set up a special fund like this that would uh, provide a reliable source of income year after year to provide uh, these, uh, these essential aspects of life uh, within the confines of the Adelaide Park. Secondly, there are, there are others that would require the Office of uh, the Economic Development to reopen there. And we require the Department of Economic Development to take a proactive role in working with localities, municipalities, to, to locate and define areas where economic development activities are appropriate and ought, and ought to go forward. One of the things that we've heard uh, over and over again from people in the park is that, uh, yes, uh, you people who live outside feel feel fine coming in here, telling us how to run our lives and how to run uh, this, uh, this, this place. But keep in mind that we live here. We have to live here all year round. And there are people here who would like to have jobs and economic opportunity. And that's what this bill does. While it recognizes the environmental uh, uniqueness of the Adirondack Park, its special place in the history of, of this state, and indeed the history of the country, it also recognizes that there are 130,000 people who live there year-round, and they have to have a place to work and, and the ability to, uh, to raise and feed their families. So that's what that, that's what this bill does, really, for Ron Stafford and for other people who, who live in the park. Uh, and we're open to other suggestions. Yes, I think Maurice just outlined what some of the new approaches. More on economic development. Yes. 
Okay. Or participation by the uh, uh, residents of the park. Okay, also, I just want to go back to the um, shoreline section. So in the land use section, <coughs> it says setbacks are raised from 50 feet to 75 feet in the hamlet, which is a relatively small part of the geographic area, and then 200 feet every place else in the county. Do you know what it is currently outside of the hamlet to support what it is? I think it varies, isn't it? I think it's the six category. Pardon me? Up to 100. It varies, and it, uh, right now it's at a maximum of 100 feet. So effectively, what we're doing is doubling the setbacks and doubling the protections for the shorelines. Now, these are the areas that are under the greatest developmental pressure. Not surprisingly, people want to be near water, and uh, this is this is one of the resources that the Adirondacks have in abundance. Uh, the, the the large number of, of lakes and, and ponds there. But we know what happens when development occurs around these lakes and ponds. What happens is that the effluent from this development makes its way down into these lakes. What you have in the Adirondacks essentially is lakes that are at the bottom of bowls. People build around, around them, and what happens, the, the, the materials from that uh, development flows down into the lakes. You get eutrophication, and you get the ultimate destruction of the lakes. We've seen the beginnings of that in Lake George. We have learned a very important lesson from Lake George. One of the things we did a couple of years ago was to work with the people in the Lake George community to develop a fund which is going to attempt to deal with this problem. So one of the aspects of this bill, and the important aspects, is setbacks for the, the water resources of the park so that we can have some sense that uh, these, these uh, lakes and ponds, which are so important to the future of the Adirondacks, will continue to exist and will not be destroyed as a result of too close to the uh, What happens when somebody has a permit application dated for a water from construction, they want to go into you know, a house on, on the lake? How is that going? They haven't built it yet, but the application is in for the uh, I think we're in no, we, don't, we, don't, we don't deal with that. I mean, this, if this, this takes effect, when, when the bill takes effect, then the provisions go into effect. It may take place before that. It's taking place before. Well, conversely, if anything is built, In line with what the Burley Commission recommended, the, the uh, density requirements that we put forth in this bill in many cases are substantially less than recommended by the Burley Commission, but more than exists today. Um, clearly, when you look at the, the question about what's in this for the people in the Adirondacks, I think we should start very eloquently. The concern about water trucks and sprawl developments along highways. Those are views and concerns that are shared by virtually everybody that lives in the Adirondacks, that visits the Adirondacks, is responsible for the Adirondacks. The question of how you got to those goals is what has been the uh, difficulty. And I think in our bill, by addressing these uh, efforts through more local planning, with money to local governments to participate in the process, encouragement of local governments to address the concerns that we think are important and other people uh, 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 designated as being important in the Adirondacks, I think we uh, try to move to those goals in, in a way that I think the communities and the residents of the Adirondacks uh, can look with. Clearly, we haven't heard from them, and that will be the next round. I think when people look at what this bill does compared to what the early re uh, recommendations were, they will see a much more even-handed, much more responsible integration of the resources and the people and the communities and businesses in the Adirondacks in the planning and the development process of what the Adirondacks will look like in the next hundred years.
meeting with the local organizations there, and local governments, and private citizens, and listening to them about how they thought we ought to fashion legislation which would uh, address the need to upgrade the law, which is now 20 years old. At the same time, if you recognize the, the uh, special nature of the Adirondacks and help celebrate its 100th anniversary. You don't have anybody here from local governments, I take it, to, to show support today in this group? No, we don't. No, no, we don't. But we have people who are residents of the Adirondacks, mm -hmm. who are members of organizations like the Adirondacks. Um, is there any provision for state land acquisition in this uh, no. can Well, the question of state land acquisition uh, anywhere in the state hinges upon the availability of resources to accomplish that objective. As you know, the bond issue a couple of years ago failed, and uh, the state has been without money to finance land acquisition, not just in the Adirondacks, but in the Catskills, and Long Island, and other places. Uh, with the speaker's encouragement, we are proposing a uh, environmental trust fund, the establishment of an environmental trust fund. This environmental trust fund would make available would become law approximately $100 million a year. Uh, it would, it would uh, use funds from existing sources, existing taxes. No new taxes would be created. Use funds from existing taxes and uh, fold those funds into a, into a fund which would uh, provide about $100 million a year for land acquisition and other environmental purposes, including uh, the expenses associated with solid waste management and other activities. So are you saying that if the state would go far away from the Adirondacks that you could come up with a trust fund? So that's why it's not a good thing. It's possible trust fund monies could be used in Adirondacks. And as Morris indicated, we had a little difficulty in money this year. Uh, thank you, Wilbur. I would like to, oh, one more question. I'd like to thank the groups that took the time and effort to come down here today and for the work that they've done with the sponsors of the bill. Sam, last question. Yeah, sorry, I, I really don't hear you. Yeah. The governor's bill, I know what pays the provisions
today, and we are going to suitably recognize her contribution a little bit later in the program. This year marks the centennial of the creation of the Adirondack Park. It, it is an extraordinary resource. It encompasses more than 6 million acres, 2.4 million of which, or 43 percent, are owned in trust by all of the people of the state of New York. The park is the largest in the contiguous United States. It contains over 40 peaks that are 4,000 feet or higher. The geological formations in the park are some 1.2 billion years old, some of the oldest geological formations on the continent. Home to 130,000 residents, that number doubles during the summer season. And more than 9 million people from this state and all around the country in various parts of the world visit the Adirondacks each year. It contains now 45 state campgrounds, 3,000 miles of trails for hiking, snowmobiling, skiing, and horseback riding, 1,300 miles of wild, scenic, and recreational rivers, most of which are open to fishing, boating, whitewater canoeing, and rafting. It contains 1 million acres of wetlands, 80 acres of alpine tundra, 2,800 lakes and ponds, 30,000 miles of brooks and streams. It is the watershed for Lake Champlain, the Hudson, Black, St. Lawrence, and Mohawk rivers. It is truly an extraordinary natural resource. And it is suitable that we should create such a park that our forefathers created it, and that we now, 100 years later, should engage in a process that recognizes that contribution and also instills in us our responsibility, a sense of our responsibility for the last 100 years, for the next 100 years. Our responsibility for the continuation and the maintenance of this extraordinary resource. There are a number of important people here today who have worked with us on this centennial and who work in furthering preservation of the Adirondacks, and it, is, it, will be, it will be my pleasure to introduce them to you. First of all, my counterpart in the New York State Senate, a man who chairs the State Senate Committee on Environmental Conservation, and with whom I have the pleasure to work on these very important issues. Please welcome Senator Owen Johnson.
The goal must be to strike a balance between what can be done for economic benefit now and what must be protected in order to protect the generations in the future. Last week, we in the Assembly introduced a proposal that strikes that balance, a balance between maintaining the splendid beauty of this magnificent park and providing economic opportunity for the 130,000 New Yorkers who call this spectacular city their home. Maury Sinchi and Pete Granis have done an incredible job in crafting this legislation, balancing the demands of today with the needs of tomorrow. The governor has his own proposal. We're looking at the governor's ideas and we'll negotiate with him. And we'll negotiate with the Senate, local official, and residents of the park, and others who care deeply about the future of this extraordinary place. We have to recapture that vision of 1892. Our state has been given an extraordinary legacy. The Adirondack Park has been handed over to us to use, but not abuse. We have to move carefully. Once lost, the beauty of the Adirondacks will never be recaptured. We should enjoy the legacy these visionaries handed down to us, enjoy the remarkable beauty, the extraordinary reverence for nature that this park inspires. And we should enjoy the opportunity the park provides as well. But we also have an obligation to guarantee that legacy can be passed on to future generations. I believe we can provide that guarantee, that we can strike that balance. I believe that working together, we can assure economic opportunity for the residents of the park today, and we can help make sure that 100 years from now, on its 200th anniversary, New Yorkers will still be in awe of the magnificent beauty and extraordinary opportunity of the Adirondack Park that we're all working so together to preserve. I thank you for inviting me. Why? 
private nonprofit community has organized over 100 centennial events, both inside and outside the Adirondack Park. Barbara McMartin has tapped the surprise until I walked up to the podium and saw that there was this box with this large plaque right here in front of the podium or behind it. Uh, so that's when I realized that this thing was here and what was happening. So I was, I was a little bit awkward, so I just moved it over there. <laughs> Shelley, thank you very much. And my, my thanks to the Sierra Club for all the good work that they do and especially for sending you here to Albany. You have been extraordinary in carrying forth the agenda for the environment here in New York on behalf of the, on behalf of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club has not been adequately represented in this part of the country, I don't think, until very recently. But you have made an extraordinary difference. You've made up, I think, for all the years that uh, they failed to recognize the importance of New York. Finally, they sent you here, and you have been just wonderful. We love you.